Hi, welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization in the global blockchain revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And my name is Brian Fabian Crane. We're here today with Jeff Garzik. Of course, many in the blockchain industry will have heard of Jeff. He's been uh, around this industry for a very, very long time. He was a Bitcoin, one of the first Bitcoin core developers, one of the most influential ones. He's also had a lot of other projects that he's been working on. So I'm super excited to have, have you on, Jeff. Thanks a lot. And uh, hello, world. So we talked briefly before the show, right? So of course, we want to hear a bit about uh, how you originally got involved in Bitcoin, which I think was like 2009 or 10 or like a very long time ago. Oh, it was uh, back in 99. I think I have about 20 years of blockchain experience. No, no, just kidding. <laughs> I've seen some job ads claiming, uh, you know, they want candidates with 10, 15 years of blockchain experience. And I really wonder, uh, you know, what kind of people they're hiring because those don't, just don't exist. Well, Satoshi but, uh, may have 10 years, right? Yeah. So that, that would be one job candidate. <laughs> but yeah, the great slash dotting of July 2010 when uh, myself, Jed McCaleb of Mt. Gox fame and many other uh, people found uh, Bitcoin from... Uh, just one single article on this News for Nerds website. Cool. And but before Bitcoin, right? You had a long history in in working on Linux as well. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've sort of been a nerd all my life. I've been uh, programming since the age of eight, uh, working on uh, Trash eighty uh, computers that. Uh, Fans will know what I'm talking about, and everyone else will have no clue what I'm talking about. Uh, programming Basic and Pascal, and that uh, uh, led me to uh, working on uh, the first uh, CNN website uh, here in Atlanta. They uh, put out the call, um, and that uh, led me to Linux and Linus Torvalds working on uh, open source software. It was this, uh, at the time, amazing environment where you can... Uh, if you want to make a software change and you're a software developer, uh, you make that change, you create this file called a patch, which uh, describes your change, and then you, you email it to uh, the software maintainer, the leader, uh, the inventor of uh, Linux, in my case, Linus Torvalds. And it's uh, kind of like throwing spaghetti at a wall. He gets hundreds of emails a day, and you wonder if he's uh, going to even listen to a, a nobody who... Uh, is at some college in Atlanta, and uh, he did. He uh, received my patch. He applied it to the the Linux kernel, which is the the core of every Android operating system and uh, Linux running in every data center. And that was sort of the start of a, a twenty year journey in open source. Was uh, that uh, first introduction to to merit based programming and meritocracies that. You know, if my patch was, uh, you know, complete crap, uh, then uh, people tell you your patch is complete crap and uh, here's how to improve your change. But uh, it was accepted and that, uh, you know, gave a, a young developer that sort of boost, uh, you know, the little ego boost or whatever that you uh, need to get up in the morning and keep going every day and pursue your pursue your dreams and uh, this internet open source stuff, working in public, airing your, uh, your dirty laundry in public every day on open source mailing lists as you discuss changes. That was a, a really appealing environment. And uh, Linux in the early days, in the early 90s, mirrors blockchain uh, almost uh, to the T in many ways today. It's it's roxious. There's a lot of flame wars and factional back and forth and all sorts of uh, uh, silliness. But at the end of the day, it's it's serious engineering. People are passionate because they care about what they're doing. They care about uh, making changes in the world. World. So that was Linux, and I think that's uh, Bitcoin and blockchain today. So having been in, in open source software, you know, for for so long. Uh, you mentioned, you know, sending those patches through email. Uh, of course, th there's been a, a, quite a bit of evolution since then. I mean, we've 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 gone from that sort of very simple system to then like SVN and uh, and and now like Git and and these new types of uh, of 
community, uh, open source uh, platforms. You know, in in your view, what has been the most fundamental change in open source? And similarly, like what has remained the same? Like how how has open source fundamentally changed since twenty years, and how is it also very similar? Well, uh, I was fortunate enough to be there at the birth of uh, Git. There was a uh, uh, that was originally written by Linus uh, over uh, a couple weeks, and due to some copyright and licensing issues, uh, we were uh, having trouble with the email Linus patches, and he applies them manually. System, uh, he uh, he and I and everyone else we disliked uh, SVN. We dislike CVS. Uh, those didn't really seem like solutions. There was one solution that uh, nobody has really ever heard of, BitKeeper. Uh, it's still around, and that was uh, one of the inspirations. The first uh, of these uh, repos that allows you to clone the entire repo, the entire history. Uh, whereas SVN, CVS, they were very server-based. They were very client server and where this was decentralized and that was a huge, huge point. Uh, and it trickles back to Bitcoin and blockchain today is that you can work remote. You, uh, your repo might be the leader. Maybe if you get, get hit by a bus as the proverbial saying goes, uh, uh, your friend becomes the leader simply because he has the latest uh, repository. That was the way uh, early uh, Git worked as well. And uh, we moved away from that BitKeeper system because it was closed. There were a lot of non-open source, uh, non-open license components. Uh, so we went full Git. And uh, how has it changed in 20 years? Sadly, it's become more centralized. Is that uh, Git was originally intended to be, you post your repos on your websites, uh, I'll post uh, my repos on my websites. Uh, we each pull from each other's. If uh, one repo dies, uh, everyone else has a clone. Uh, very decentralized, very natural. Uh, GitHub, which uh, I use every day, uh, I love it. But at the same time, uh, I think uh, the open source world would melt down if uh, GitHub and Travis go offline for 24 hours. So it's been more centralized, and I hope that uh, we find a way to make it less centralized. What do you think of these new systems that are now coming into this space? Um, I forgot the names exactly, uh, but you know the, these these sort of blockchain-based, decentralized Git platforms. Well, that was always uh, the natural extension for Git. Uh, Git stores objects. In, you know, it hashes an object. And it's really a uh, hash-based uh, uh, object storage system, almost a file system. And that's, that's no surprise coming from uh, Linus and uh, Unix and everything is a file type uh, computing philosophy. And uh, we see today with, say, IPFS. Uh, IPFS would be a, and I'm pretty sure there's a Git connector for it, uh, is a natural extension for Git because it's ultimately an object addressable system. You say, give me this hash and here's this get commit. And we're doing the same things in blockchain with blocks and transactions. We're doing the same thing with IPFS, uh, just that, uh, you know, content addressable, object addressable file system. It's, it's really the, just an extension. And so I had spec'd out uh, 15 years ago a Git with BitTorrent. And uh, IPFS, uh, honestly, uh, you know, unintentionally uh, took my design and improved it a hundredfold. And so it's, it's a very natural extension, I think, for today. Yeah, I'm sure we're going to see some, uh, a lot of interesting developments. In, in, here in Berlin, there's a team called Oscoin that's kind of working on something like that, too. But so to move to Bitcoin now, so you learned about it in 2010. And then how did you get involved and what was your role in, you know, in that early stage of the project? Sure. Well, uh, it mirrored my Linux experience almost exactly. Um, I uh, made a change, created a patch, emailed the leader of the software project, and uh, they uh, accepted the patch. 
it was it was really that simple. Um, you know, other patches were, uh, you know, you get feedback, you get a patch rejected. Um, hopefully, the the leader doesn't say your patch is complete crap, and uh, that's sort of the open source merit based development uh, method. It was uh, Satoshi and Gavin. Uh, in those days, were uh, primarily uh, leading development. Uh, Satoshi uh, sort of transitioned the the lead merge role or the project maintainer role to Gavin, uh, while still uh, providing uh, you know the leadership and changes for uh, say six months to a year. Then uh, T- Satoshi sort of faded out of the picture. Uh, he just uh, emailed and said, "I'm going to be busy for a while." And I uh, went uh, communicated less and less frequently, and eventually stopped uh, communicating at all. And that that pretty much mirrored his uh, forum uh, posts as well. Is uh, on Bitcoin Talk, he uh, posted a lot, and then less and less, and eventually uh, just sort of faded away. And I think that uh, uh, that that more than anything else stop. Stopping the leaving of a trail of data fingerprints is the best thing you can do to protect your anonymity. And uh, being anonymous, it forced all of the other engineers, myself included, to really just look at the code and say, does this make sense from a code perspective? You know, I don't know who this random anonymous guy is. And so I'm not putting any credit in the authority of a person X, person Y, person named Satoshi, I'm putting all of the credit in my evaluation of the code. So again, very open, very merit-based, and being a being pseudonymous uh, really made that, uh, really crystallized that, I think, for the rest of the engineers. And so you did you keep continuing to you know make little improvements submit them was there a particular parts of the code base that you mostly worked on or what was kind of um i was sort of a jack of all trades uh you know the uh early pain point was uh the initial block download it's still uh, sort of a pain point today is that uh downloading and validating the blockchain before uh the node is up and running so I made uh, many improvements to uh, improve that user experience uh, based on all my uh, experience with storage and Linux. I did a lot of early mining work. I wrote uh, the one of the first mining pools. I wrote uh, the first uh, CPU miner. Uh, Satoshi actually asked me to do that uh, since there were so many uh, requests to you know put in this optimi- optimization, that optimization into the in-client miner, uh, he asked me to uh, create an external CPU miner. And uh, the uh, ASIC miners, you know, the bit mains and uh, that whatnot, uh, the mining software buried deep inside uh, still uh, carries some of the remnants of my early uh, CPU mining work from uh, many, many uh, er uh, eons ago, it seems. Uh, so mining, there was a lot of uh, API work uh, inside uh, the node. I turned it into what I call a router. I uh, stripped out the uh, wallet. I made a, a no wallet mode inside of Bitcoin Core that uh, is sort of hyper secure and uh, hyper optimized just being a full node. Uh, that work is uh, still there today. Uh, there, are, there are a lot of other uh, bits and bobs in there as well. Uh, but uh, it's sort of a look for a pain point and uh, fix it. Uh, that's uh, that's really what I uh, consider my role. And so you'll uh, see me all over the place. Uh, if it weren't for a quirk in uh, GitHub commit statistics, I would still uh, show up as one of the top 20 uh, Bitcoin core contributors. Cool. Yeah. And and then, so you worked on BitPay as well, right? I think you were one of the first kind of like, you know, Bitcoin focused developers to get paid by a startup, you know, to exclusively work on BitPay, right? Uh, Bitcoin. Yeah, I left uh, Red Hat in 2013. Uh, I took uh, what uh, at the time I thought was a big risk going into uh, this new Bitcoin blockchain space. Uh, and uh, jumped over to BitPay. 
Uh, BitPay has really turned out to be uh, just an amazing, uh, not only business, but community. There are at least five or six uh, businesses that were spawned by BitPay alumni uh, after uh, working there. Uh, it's a really amazing tech-focused shop. The CEO, Stephen Pear, has a, a real uh, sharp head on his shoulders. And uh, so I'm not surprised to see uh, uh, not just myself, but uh, a lot of the Argentinians like Zeppelin Solutions, a big uh, smart contract auditing shop, uh, several others. They're all uh, alumni of BitPay. So you then um, went on to found to co-found Block. Uh, tell us tell us how you how that came to be and how you met Matt Rozak and founded Block. Sure. Well, uh, rewinding the story a bit, uh, a couple years to uh, 2014, uh, after BitPay, I went to uh, uh, one of my passions, which is space. And I developed what was then uh, the first uh, open source satellite. Uh, the United States has a lot of uh, really annoying rules about exporting satellite technology uh, outside the borders of the United States. It's really sort of left over from the Cold War type rules. Um, and uh, people may remember back in uh, 96 when uh, President Clinton uh, freed cryptography. Uh, before that, if you took source code, crypto source code from the U.S. and crossed the border with U.S. source code, uh, crypto source code, you were exporting munitions uh, weapons grade munitions, you know, that's how dangerous they can, uh, considered cryptography and, uh, Clinton in 96, uh, uh, issued an executive order, uh, changing that. And then we had the internet boom and, uh, you know, free cryptography frees people, which frees markets, which frees commerce. We saw that in 96. I'm just saying people crossing the border with like floppies. That's right. Of crypto like <laughs> no there's a famous story of the uh phil zimmerman the author of pgp he printed the entire source code on an ocr friendly book he got on a plane and flew outside the united states with this book and then scanned it in and that's how pgp was legally successfully exported from the united states it was uh using the first amendment and uh, printing it as a book. And uh, Phil, on the plane, he was scared. He uh, didn't know if he was going to get arrested for exporting weapons-grade munitions or not. Uh, so all sorts of arcane rules. And they, uh, you know, sort of getting back on track, those were the same in space. Is uh, Even if you build the world's most commodity satellite, you downloaded instructions off the Internet, you 3D printed them, you bought an off-the-shelf computer, that's still exporting a uh, restricted material, according to the U.S. Department of State, U.S. Department of Commerce. And so I worked through all the paperwork and mess to get uh, approvals to post my satellite design on the Internet. And uh, that was uh, Dunvegan Space Systems in 2014. The first open source satellite, it's still there today, dss.co on your web browser. And uh, you can go see the BitSat. And uh, down at the bottom, there's a 97-page preliminary design review. That's essentially the BitSat uh, technical specification. And that's what we had to get State Department approval uh, to open source. But uh, you asked about Block. Uh, that, that's sort of how I met Matt, my co-founder at Block, is uh, Matt uh, was a very uh, successful uh, entrepreneur, and uh, he came out of the private equity space. He uh, built and ran six enterprise software companies, was very successful. Uh, he found the blockchain space in 2013, uh, started uh, investing in the various uh, bridges, roads, and tunnels of blockchain, wallets, Payment processors, miners, uh, yeah, many of the companies uh, that we're familiar with. And uh, through that, uh, he met uh, just about everybody in the blockchain space, myself included. And I got him involved in Dunvegan, 
uh, DSS. And uh, there are all sorts of, uh, you know, puns and jokes to be made. Uh, you know, never got to space. The launch never launched. Uh, you know, the, the space venture uh, never uh, got what it needed, which was a, uh, a very large ticket of $14 million to build a constellation in, of uh, satellites in space. But uh, I met uh, so many people uh, during that experience. Uh, Matt was one of those. And, uh, you know, sort of getting back to present, uh, Matt and I got together in late 2015 and we whiteboarded what are the, the biggest opportunities in, uh, you know, Bitcoin, blockchain, crypto. And uh, that is the sort of uh, Red Hat of blockchain format. Uh, there are a lot of open source projects, there's a lot of uh, developers, a lot of innovation, but at the same time, if you're a large enterprise business, uh, like a Goldman Sachs, a JP Morgan, some of the, you know, the, the bigger uh, household names, you're not going to rely on a volunteer developer at three in the morning when uh, your software is uh, failing. You need that, uh, you know, professional support, professional maintenance. That's uh, that's essentially what Red Hat gives uh, big businesses uh, enterprise today. And that's what we formed Block Around was that, uh, you know, taking blockchain and specifically, you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum, the public networks uh, to enterprise. But what, we, what surprised us was this, uh, uh, you know, not just the Fortune 500, but what I call the Crypto 500. So many uh, startups are these days well-funded and uh, they need help. They need blockchain expertise. They need uh, people to help tokenize this or that. And uh, so we formed uh, Block Labs, uh, which is kind of like a Xerox Park or a Bell Labs to complement that. And that's where Metronome and some of these other token projects are coming. So there's like the enterprise side of the house, working with the Fortune 500 and the Block Lab side of the house, building decentralized networks. And those really feed each other. And so what are the main products that you're selling at Block? Like, What what types of solutions are you building for enterprise? Because I know you have this sort of technology, but you also have this consulting business. Uh, not No, not really consulting. No? Uh, we have a product, Block Enterprise, that uh, again, sort of similar to Red Hat, is sold for a uh, monthly subscription. So you get uh, the software as well as you get hot fixes, maintenance, updates, customer support, uh, et cetera. And uh, that's, that's the product, Block Enterprise. That's our one uh, software product. And then uh, on the other side of the house, we uh, build uh, uh, decentralized products like. Uh, metronome. I really believe that when you're 10 years in the future, when iShares BlackRock is building the next ETF, they're going to build it like we're building uh, Metronome in some of these products. And so uh, that's that's the other side of the house. We we don't really do uh, consulting. Okay, I I miss a, I must have misread the website then. Um, so uh, to stay on the topic of enterprise for just for another few minutes. What, what what types of things are you learning? I mean, coming from the open source space and working on 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 Bitcoin and these sort of anarchic distributed systems, what sort of things are you learning from working with enterprise that have very different needs? Um, this is coming from someone who spends most of his time selling blockchain to enterprise as well, so <laughs> I, I can relate to that. Um, and what do you see as the future there? Uh, is this something that you think will... Because at the moment, there's there's a massive uh, need, right? Enter enterprises and Fortune 500s are are hungry for for this technology. They 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 want to experiment with this technology and and see how they can use it, and presumably to understand how it may change their business. Do you think that this is something that will continue, or will open systems sort of take the lead at some point and become the dominant place where innovation occurs? Well, I think that, uh, and, and Block very much built its strategy around open systems will all and open networks will always be the driver of innovation. And so uh, very specifically, our uh, Block Enterprise product, for example, 
is uh, only open networks, only software that came from open networks that have been field tested with real money over time. And so that's sort of Bitcoin and the Bitcoin cousins and Ethereum and the Ethereum cousins. And there are a lot of uh, young whippersnappers uh, software wise that are wet cement. But uh, strategically, we, we ask ourselves, what is going to generate that innovation over time? Um, it's going to be the open source community. It's not going to be uh, just to you know, pick on uh, one particular company. It's not going to be a customer relying on R3 and only R3 for R3 blockchains. That's a higher total cost of ownership for the customer and a smaller community. And therefore, you rely on R3 much more to generate all the innovation that you as a customer are looking for. Whereas if you stick with open networks and open source, you've got the whole universe of Bitcoin, Ethereum, Monero, Zcash, all of that innovation to pull from. And where are you going to be 12 months from now, 24 months from now? If you have that open source, open network strategy, you're going to be pulling from the same piece of same source of innovation everyone else is pulling from. It's not a, a sidetrack like uh, proprietary systems. And so open networks always win, open source always wins. Um, with that said, I think that uh, private blockchain is always going to be around. That's essentially like a VPN of sorts and uh, you know, privacy and uh, private networks and uh, private data distributions, they always make sense. But the software, the robustness that comes from openness, open networks, the innovation that comes from openness and open networks. You know, I really do believe we're reinventing the Internet. You know, none of, uh, you know, the apps on our smartphone and the, the you know, the, the websites that we're familiar with today, none of that would have happened if you needed a license to use the Internet. Uh, openness, permissionless innovation. That's what blockchain brings, and that's what the internet brought 20 years ago. And for enterprises, they'll, they'll dabble with private networks. They'll set up consortiums because that, that's sort of a comfort level. But it's really just blockchain with training wheels. The, the action, the innovation, that happens out in the open. Yeah, I very much agree with this perspective. I, I would like, before we go to metronome, uh, I would like to come to a topic that of course also many especially those following bitcoin have been or very aware of which is the segway 2x thing right so this scalability debate of course has been going on for many years i mean i think we did podcasts on episodes on this podcast like back in 2014 about that topic and then i would say kind of the culmination of that was segway 2x last year where a group of people, and, and you were a, a very key person there, pushed for a, a block increase to two megabytes as well as the activation, activation of SegWit. Of course, we did get SegWit, but not the, not the 2x block size increase. And now this has also kind of facilitated the, the split into Bitcoin Cash and, uh, and Bitcoin. So just looking back on this, how... What's your point of view as, as we have some distance on that? What happened there? Well, the, uh, you know, starting at the fundamentals, uh, Satoshi introduced a temporary limit, uh, you know, many years ago, that uh, one megabyte base block size limit. And it was always the plan when he introduced that limit to uh, increase it at a uh, particular either block or date. And so that was always the working plan. That was the plan that was communicated to the market and uh, what uh, many people uh, build businesses on. Uh, but uh, starting uh, sort of with uh, Bitcoin XT in 2015 is uh, there was, uh, you know, pushback to following that uh, sort of original uh, Satoshi uh, block size increase plan. And uh, there were there was uh, Bitcoin XT in 2015, Bitcoin Classic, uh, Bitcoin Unlimited, SegWit2x. 
those are all sort of progressions and uh, attempts to follow that uh, original upgrade plan to uh, increase the block size. And each time there was, uh, you know, mud slung and, and all sorts of, uh, you know, DDoSing of nodes and shenanigans and things of that nature uh, that uh, push back against that. And uh, it was, uh, you know, the Segway2x was sort of the latest chapter in that. And it was a, a really disappointing spectacle of uh, pushing back uh, in some quarters against businesses that have been asking for this for years uh, and uh, ultimately uh, didn't go in that particular direction. So at the end of the day, there was a consensus and, uh, you know, the world moved on. Uh, my predictions, uh, you know, were either sort of path A or path B. Uh, path A is SegWit succeeds. You know, obviously it didn't. And uh, Bitcoin largely continues as one coin in one community. Or uh, path B is what I call the messy divorce. And uh, that's essentially that uh, uh, one uh, faction uh, won and, you know, wasn't able to come together with some of the other factions. And so uh, you have a split and you've got not just Bitcoin Cash, but you've got a bazillion uh, Bitcoin forks out there. You've got a ton of tokens. You've got uh, people uh, like the Decred team from 24 months ago, uh, you know, moving to an entirely different platform. Um, you've got this sort of, you know, it's a, uh, a spreading out or a Cambrian explosion of both projects as well as forks. And that's all of that is, uh, you know, fed in part by uh, that messy divorce phase that I talked about. So we're, we're in, uh, you know, the, the second of two predictions is that messy divorce phase. And this is entirely uh, predicted and uh, we'll, we'll sort of see where it goes from here. And so messy divorce, that's also messy divorce for you, right? Like you also feel personally you've mo moved on from Bitcoin and are focusing on. Oh no, not now. at all. We have uh, a lot of Bitcoin customers, so you know we uh, we're still uh, full bore on Bitcoin itself. And so, Bitcoin customers, you mean for block or yes? And what what, what does that mean, Bitcoin customers? What what do you actually? What kind of uh, they uh, they pay for our block enterprise product in Bitcoin. Our block enterprise product is uh, a uh, software oh, a suite that uh, provides uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum. Uh, it'll soon provide uh, Litecoin, Bitcoin Cash, uh, both at the node level, the wallet level, SDKs, modules, uh, basically uh, everything you need to uh, either connect to Bitcoin. Spend some Bitcoin, check your Bitcoin. Uh, it's sort of that infrastructure software. Uh, so it's a uh, an enterprise hardened node if you want to oversimplify. Uh, so if you connect a Bitcoin network and you want to run a full node, for example, uh, you can either again depend on uh, volunteer developers and unpaid support, or you're if you're an enterprise, uh, you can uh, consume hardened, QA'd, secured uh, software and the support package along with it. And so uh, that's what we mean by uh, Bitcoin customers is customers that are using Bitcoin in their businesses. They're using our infrastructure software to do that. Okay. Okay. And, but still, right. Uh, you may, you Use the term messy divorce. It did seem, you know, quite vicious at times, and uh, and you know certainly we were to some extent also uh, saw that, you know, in comments and stuff like that. So, do you feel like there are some important lessons that you take away from that, or what are some things you learned during that whole segue to X thing that you didn't know before? You know, it uh, it was basically what we expected is that uh, in previous, uh, uh, you know, iterations like the Bitcoin Classic and the Bitcoin Unlimited, you saw uh, a lot of astroturfing, you saw DDoSing of, uh, you know, Bitcoin Core alternatives, uh, you know, you saw companies uh, sending executives all over the world to 
you know, uh, you know, throw mud at me and throw mud at other developers and stuff like that. Uh, it was really uh, quite silly, but uh, all of that was expected. We expected unprofessional behavior from, you know, other, uh, you know, prominent uh, blockchain companies and and we got it. Uh, you know, Bitcoin today, over 80 percent of all changes that go into Bitcoin core are originated from one of two companies. And no surprise, the developers and contractors and execs who work for those two companies were some of the loudest on uh, social media. So there, you know, all of this was entirely expected. None of it was a surprise. Uh, so again, down to, uh, you know, that uh, messy divorce outcome. Great. So um, now moving on to, uh, to our last topic of, of uh, today's episode, but an important one, uh, it, which is Metronome. Uh, so Metronome is a project that has been, uh, I guess you would say spun off by Block, right? It's a, it's a Block product. Um, so could you please tell us uh, what is Metronome? Uh, why did you build this product? And what problem is it fundamentally trying to solve? Sure. So Metronome is a uh, new cryptocurrency, sort of a uh, design from clean slate uh, cryptocurrency with an eye on resilience, durability, something that'll uh, last a long time. Uh, so there's uh, one of the things that uh, was uh, has been obvious for many years, not just with you know the various Bitcoin dramas, uh, the various Ethereum dramas, Ethereum hard forks. Uh, we see all this stuff. Uh, why should a currency or an asset be limited to a single blockchain? And why should that money supply not be engineered for the long term? Uh, so we really looked at uh, what is the best of Ethereum, what is the best of Bitcoin, uh, and uh, what's the, the latest technology in terms of building a cryptocurrency that will... Uh, ideally outlast its creator. Uh, what's the uh, uh, cryptocurrency that will outlast uh, Block's existence? How can we uh, create and incubate something like that? One of my uh, uh, philosophical uh, and uh, philanthropic uh, interests is the, the Long Now Foundation. Uh, it's uh, longnow.org. It's one of the... Uh, groups that uh, is building, among other things, a 10,000-year clock, a clock that will continue operating for 10,000 years. And the philosophy there, in gen you know, highly generalized, is that we pay way too much attention to the short term. We, uh, you know, corporations look at quarterly numbers. The stock market looks at quarterly earnings. We plan for the next month, the next sprint, the next uh, quarter, the next year, we need to instead plan for the next decade, the next 25 years, the next century. And so that was really the uh, motivation behind Metronome is uh, Bitcoin supply, for example, uh, declines to zero. It uh, halves every four years. Ethereum's currency supply is uh, a big question mark. Right now, it's uh, five Ether per block, new money supply. But uh, the developers have openly communicated that that's going to change. We just don't know how it's going to change. So uh, if you're looking at it from a monetary perspective, a currency supply perspective, there, there's a big question mark in the future of one of the foundational currencies. So Metronome was really... Uh, the genesis of that is if we start with a clean sheet of paper, what would we uh, build in terms of a cryptocurrency that's there for the long term? And so that's what we came up with. It's a ERC-20 compatible cryptocurrency that runs on any chain that supports uh, Ethereum VM. And it has uh, extensions for... Uh, ERC-827, which is sort of the, the latest uh, token standard, it adds uh, mass pay, which Bitcoin has, but it's new to Ethereum. You've, uh, and this saves a lot on transaction fees, a lot on gas. If you can have one transaction on an ETH chain pay out to 10, 50, 100 people, 
Uh, you know, that's no sweat for Bitcoin, multiple transaction outputs, but that's new to Ethereum. So we engineered that into Metronome. Subscriptions, which are new to blockchain in general, uh, because uh, blockchains are push rather than pull uh, type payments. Uh, we added subscriptions and uh, several other uh, payment type features. So it's really a cryptocurrency uh, from scratch that uh, we want to be durable for the long term. Let me just jump in though one point here, which is one of the in so interesting, but I also find strange things about Metronome, right? Because Metronome doesn't have its own blockchain, right? It lives on That's right. Ethereum, right? So in, in one way, it seems kind of strange to me to say, okay, we're going to build this thing that's really, really durable. It's going to exist forever. It's better than the existing platforms that aren't built for the long term, but it, it's dependent on them, or particularly Ethereum, and, and it's built on top. It seems like... Um, Contradiction yeah, very, to me. No, I, I totally get it. And, uh, you know, computer scientists, we're, we're used to thinking abstractly. And we use the blockchain as a security layer that, that is, or a transport layer for uh, metronome. But uh, at the same time, we said it's so important that if, it, if you're on a single chain and you have that token, basically you have to sell out of that token to leave that universe, to leave that blockchain. Whereas with Metronome, uh, we draw the analogy to you, if your Metronome asset is a gold bar, you can take that gold bar to a new warehouse. That's uh, porting your Metronome from one chain to another. And maybe that warehouse is a little bit better. Maybe it has uh, nicer uh, security cameras outside or something like that uh, to, you know, to make an analogy. But essentially, uh, unlike other sort of cross-chain products, there's no asset exchange, there's no swap. And so for uh, tax purposes, that's very, very, very important. If you're doing, for example, a cross-chain swap going from Bitcoin to Litecoin, you just had a tax event. You know, maybe you bought your Bitcoin in 2011. And uh, when you exchange your Bitcoin in 2018 for Litecoin, you just had a tax event, potentially a very big tax event. And so even if it's a cross-chain atomic swap, you're still moving through assets. Whereas with Metronome, it's the same asset moving to a different blockchain. And so that's the, that's the new and different part uh, in terms of uh, cross-chain. So I'd like to, to dissect this. There's a lot here. So um, one of the things that that uh, sticks out on your website uh, is is this idea of a self governed, portable, and reliable system. So uh, we we've covered the um, the reliability aspect. I think what you mean by that is that this is a system that is meant to last for a very long time, right? Where the currency continues to um, be created over time. The portability aspect, being able to move these coins from one blockchain to another, and we'll dig into that in, in a few minutes. But the self-govern aspect, could you describe how Metronome is self-governed? What does that mean exactly? Sure. So uh, this uh, import-export mechanism, uh, you export your Metronome and your Metronome only uh, and from one blockchain, and you import your Metronome and your Metronome only into a new blockchain or you know, possibly the same blockchain. And so... The self-governing part is that each stakeholder is selecting where their metronome will live. And so, for example, and metronome is self-adjusting. So, for example, if half of all metronome holders are on the ETH Classic chain and half of all metronome holders are on the ETH chain, then the daily auctions are split in half. And half the daily uh, supply of new metronome appears on the ETH chain in a daily auction, and half of the new metronome daily supply appears on the ETH Classic chain. And you participate in different contract sets. And as a result, it is self selecting. You control your stake and your stake only. Block doesn't have any say whatsoever in where you put your metronome. And so that's the self-governing aspect is if you see 
that, uh, hey, maybe trouble's on the horizon on the Ethereum chain, then I'm going to port my metronome over to the ETH Classic chain and let the, let the storm clouds pass. But uh, it's in your hands to make that decision. Block has no control over uh, where your metronome is or, you know, how you transfer it. Okay. Thank, thanks for pointing that out. So you, you mentioned auctions. Um, so let's, let's then uh, dig into the different components of metronome. So there are essentially four smart contracts. There's the, the auctions contracts, the proceeds contract. There's an autonomous converter contract, and then the the, the contract that issues the token, the ERC twenty contract. Could could you describe sort of the the flow of metronome uh, tokens uh, in, in these contracts, and sort of like from the auction to say like a potential trade of uh, ETH for metronome, for instance. Sure, sure. So uh, the first contract, which is not really in that flow, that's the uh, ERC-20, uh, ERC-827 uh, token management piece. Uh, that's what uh, most other tokens have. I like to call uh, uh, Ethereum uh, <laughs> LOL, Ledger of Ledgers, and that's uh, what ERC-20 is, and that's uh, what uh, this is, and it's no different. Um, from that, we added, uh, like I mentioned, uh, some uh, new features, mass pay, subscription, and uh, some other features. The second contract auction, every day after uh, the initial auction of uh, 8 million on day zero, every day there's a daily auction of 2,880 tokens, and that's uh, two a minute. And uh, that is uh, sale at uh, using a descending price auction. And a brief explanation, uh, descending price auction it's not like a reverse Dutch auction. It's a bit different. Uh, it's uh, amusingly like uh, Crypto Kitties, is that uh, the auction starts at a very high price and it ticks down every 60 seconds until you hit a market price where uh, some of the tokens are sold. And the auction ends when all of the tokens in the auction are sold. So some people might buy at one ETH, some people might buy at 0.5 ETH, some people might buy at 0.1 ETH, and uh, it's settled at the price you buy. So uh, like the rate in auction, to contrast, everyone gets the same price, the lowest price in the auction. In a descending price auction, everyone gets exactly the price they pay at that time, and it ticks down, the price is set at a specific time. So uh, from there, the auctions uh, receive ETH into the smart contract set, and the uh, auction buyer, they have metronome in their wallet. So where does that ETH go? Uh, unlike every other ICO where the ETH goes to the company's bank account, in metronome, we're, we're, we like to call it almost an un-ICO because uh, the raise doesn't come to us, there's no pre-sale. There's no, uh, you know, whales are already in by the time uh, the public uh, gets to it. There's just the public sales, just the auctions. And the ETH from those auctions goes to contract number three, the proceeds contract. The proceeds contract is basically a big savings basket. All it does is hold ETH. Now, every day... 0.25% of the total balance of all the ETH in that proceeds contract goes to contract number four, the autonomous converter contract. So 25 basis points of uh, if there's a thousand ETH or even a million ETH in that proceeds contract, every day, 0.25% of that total balance goes to the ETH side of an ETH metronome trading pair and that's what the fourth contract is and it's uh we call it an autonomous converter you uh it acts as uh both a changer as well as a market maker it is based on the bancor algorithm it's a direct simplification of uh the bancor algorithm you send eth and you get metronome you send metronome and you get eth 
and there's a particular market price that's uh, inside the contract. And if the uh, price is out of whack versus other secondary markets, other exchanges, then you have an arbitrage opportunity. You have an incentive to interact with that uh, autonomous converter contract. So the uh, flow goes from auction to proceeds to autonomous converter. And uh, the last detail, and this is a very key detail, is that uh, that ETH comes from that proceeds contract just to the ETH side of the ETH MTN trading pair. That creates a arbitrage incentive, creates an incentive for you to deposit MTN and get some of that ETH to bring the autonomous converter back to market price or back to market equilibrium. And so that's how it buys metronome on the open market. It's, it's not essentially like a, uh, a price floor type uh, mechanism, a dynamic price floor that helps incubate the metronome system over, we estimate, uh, three to four years. It's like that proceeds contract is like a slowly deflating balloon that deflates that stored ETH over three to four years, hopefully incubating the metronome system to the point where it's self-sustaining. Okay, so I think Bancor and, and this kind of auction thing is, is not easy to wrap your head around. But of course, for people who are interested in, we, we've done an episode about Bancor previously, so they, they can go check that out as well. Now, just to understand this on like a very high level when it comes to what's the point of this, it, it's basically the idea that this all this ETH is going into this contract and it's afterwards basically used to support the price of MTN. So do you expect that the result would be some kind of stable coin or somewhat stable coin? Um, no, no. It, uh, it's going to be subject to the price dynamics uh, just like any other supply constrained token, which is pretty much uh, most of the tokens out there. Uh, it just helps in that that first incubation period. What we don't want is just sort of an up and down, and then it goes to zero. And so during that incubation period, when we're trying to build a community around this, it supports the currency during that uh, incubation period. And okay. so after that, it's sort of a bird that we hope flies on its own. So, so of course, many projects, right, they, they raise money, right? And that money is then used to build software to, or many projects at this point have a lot of money, right? So they create these like ecosystem funds, build tooling, et cetera, et cetera. Now here, basically all of the proceeds are used just to support the price floor. So how exactly, like what's the mechanism by which this would create a community or incubate or create an ecosystem or? Well, it's uh, super important to us that we don't create yet another foundation. Being involved in uh, Bitcoin since the early days, we saw the, the drama and mess involved in the Bitcoin foundation. Um, there's been, you know, some drama with the Ethereum foundation. Uh, you know, anytime you get humans involved, uh, there there's drama and uh, we uh, really wanted to design this to be as resistant to uh, that as possible. And so creating some sort of ecosystem fund means you have to create gatekeepers who are uh, doling out uh, tokens and uh, making, uh, you know, very subjective choices at the end of the day. Um, you know, we're building an autonomous system, one that uh, doesn't rely on human gatekeepers. And so that was always... The, uh, the first and last rule when building metronome. And so that meant that a, a ecosystem fund that, uh, you know, where Jeff or someone else is doling out metronome to uh, build this, that, and the other, that, uh, that's just not in the cards. When you spread a cryptocurrency, when you want to bootstrap a new cryptocurrency into existence, you can't bootstrap it with the notion that on day zero, everyone has to rely on block and what block builds. Otherwise, 
it's not going to be a success. Uh, and so course. we're building software. We're building wallets, mining pools, SDKs, all on our dime. But at the end of the day, we need to build a wider community. And we think that a foundation and a fund is actually a bad idea because it creates a dependency like drugs create dependencies. No, I think that's that's a you know there's certainly very strong arguments and, and issues with having you know decentralized organizations spawning decentralized systems. I think, and I'm a huge uh, fan of DAOs, by the way, and I, I want to see those succeed. And I think there's there's a right way to do it, um, but uh, you know this is uh, not a DAO. DAOs would obviously be uh, securities, and we need to stay far far away from that. Sure, but still, I'd like to come back to the question because it's unclear to me how this mechanism of ether being used to support the price of mtn would incubate this community or create this ecosystem or, or even provide incentives for that i mean no, it, 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 it provides a price floor yes right yeah it specifically is maintenance for the economy not for the community so it's not money for the community it's not a fund for the community and we specifically designed it so that we're not creating a community fund because that would get us into DAO territory and securities territory. And that's just a bad idea for something that we want to be here 100 years from now. And so we want to not create those dependencies. We want to, in fact, engineer against, you know, having humans in the loop in a particular uh, manner. And so we feel that we've built the the not just the product, but the software around it such that that will be attractive to people. And that will be where the community building comes in, is that here's a cryptocurrency engineered for the long term. And all of the base attributes of that will be what uh, builds that community. You know, Bitcoin and Litecoin, they didn't have a community development fund. They just started and people recognize their engineering attributes and uh, built Bitcoin businesses, built Litecoin businesses. So uh, I think that the, the model of, uh, you know, we need to give you a uh, shot of adrenaline from our community development fund actually hurts in the long run. So I wanted to also come back to the topic of interoperability because, of course, it's an interesting topic, very important topic, also a topic I've been working on uh, a lot. So the to me, sort of superficial, uh, to me, reading the claims in Metronome, to be honest, they seem implausible, right? Like it does not seem that this would be possible in particular the sort of issue, right? So, so you have metronome tokens, right? They're initially on Ethereum, and now you, you're kind of allowing to move them elsewhere, and then they can be moved back. They can be moved between any chains. So the, the, the sort of scenario that immediately comes to my mind here is, wouldn't this mean that, you know, if, if any chain gets, like, corrupted or weak or double spend, then essentially, you know, let's say I can double spend metronome on one chain, I can flood them on the other chains, or doesn't that just mean the security of the metronome system becomes, you know, kind of equal to the security of the weakest link in all those chains? No, we're basically reusing the same algorithm as uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum, et cetera, is we have a, a history of the money supply changes inside each set of metronome contracts. It's like a blockchain on blockchains and so if one say double spends or violates the rules it uh, just like in bitcoin when you violate the rules you instantly become invisible to everyone else in the metronome universe so if uh, we go off on you know jeff chain which uh let's say inflates metronome supply by 2x then no other metronome chain would accept my metronome ported out of this corrupted system. And so basically it's the same algorithm that Bitcoin uses for validation, the same algorithm that Ethereum uses for validation. But how are, how are chains aware of each other in this protocol? Basically uh, the, the simplified version would be that 
you, when you're porting your metronome, you're also submitting other people's transactions to that chain at the same time. And that's required to provide a proof from other chains to your local chain. And so people are essentially the vectors for spreading metronome money supply tr change transactions across many chains. And the, there's a stake weight associated with it. And so, for example, if 80% is on metronome and 20% is on, or excuse me, 80% is on the ETH chain, 20% is on ETH Classic, and uh, you want to, uh, say, port to chain XYZ, then the stake weight is going to be 80 plus 20 minus whatever your stake is moving to that new chain. And so uh, the ETH history has an 80% weight. ETH Classic has a 20% weight. And so if you try to introduce a uh, corrupted history, you uh, are measured against that uh, stake weight on each chain. But so just hypothetically speaking, let's say I, I have or 20% of MTN live on ETH Classic. Now Ethereum Classic gets attacked. Somehow someone uses this to double spend MTN on another chain. Does that essentially burn all the MTN that was on the Ethereum Classic chain? Yeah, if the chain suddenly gets corrupted and uh, no longer follows standard smart contract rules, then it's uh, it's gone rogue. So and all basically all the of the tokens anymore. that live on that chain at that time are destroyed. Yeah, that's basically the same as chain death, except since it's metronome, you had the opportunity if you had foresight to move your tokens off the chain before it gets corrupted, where if you're, if you're holding ETC, you're just screwed. But if you're holding MTN, at least you have a chance to move off the ETC chain. Right, o although on the ETC chain, right, you may have some recovery. I mean, there may be some kind of brief attack, but then, but it, it seems like, you know, with MTN, it's like, there's no recovery, right? Once, it, once there is this double spend or something, it's uh it's done well definitionally if the chain is intact then metronome is intact it won't permit a double spend if the chain is intact and so if a double spend happened then the chain is corrupted and etc is uh corrupted and, and so how does another how do those other chains know that a, a double spend happened is there there's no, is there some sort of social consensus on like kind of governance? Like, okay, this China is going rogue. We need to stop accepting metro. No, it's, it's just like transfers. the Bitcoin and Ethereum validation procedures is it's either a transaction is, is either a valid or B not valid. And if it's not valid, then it just doesn't exist from the standpoint of other chains. Uh, it's the same as a Bitcoin transaction is. Bitcoin transactions are either valid and in which case you process them or they're not valid and they just don't exist from your standpoint. So it's, it's just reusing the Bitcoin algorithm inside of a set of smart contracts. Okay, can you explain that? I don't understand how that is reusing the Bitcoin algorithm. Uh, so, a, I mean, we're, we're kind of getting into basic blockchain here. Um, is uh, a blockchain is a container for a set of transactions and the transactions are shared across many nodes. Eventually they're collected into a block and the block is then shared across those nodes and each of the transactions and blocks are validated according to a shared set of consensus rules. And if any of those transactions or blocks don't validate according to those consensus rules, then uh, they just don't exist. They're rejected. They're, they're not validated. That's how Bitcoin pre prevents double spends, is that uh, double spends aren't validated. They aren't valid according to Bitcoin consensus rules. So similarly, a double spend of a metronome money supply, a double port, 
uh, is just rejected in the same way that a Bitcoin rejects a double spend. And transactions in blocks are uh, shared similarly to, uh, you know, between contract sets by users who want to import and export their metronome. So you have a blockchain inside a blockchain with metronome. Okay, so so it's maybe the way to think about this, which is kind of hard to wrap your head around, that almost if you, okay, in Bitcoin, right, we have different nodes that communicate, produce blocks. So in metronome, a blockchain is like a node. A set of contracts is like a node. A set of contracts is a full node. And those will have sufficient capabilities to like detect hard forks or any kind of events like that in other chains. Yeah, they again, it's they process them just like Bitcoin and Ethereum process uh, uh, new transactions and blocks. Okay, well, I mean, it will be interesting to to read more a bit about how exactly technically it's going to work because it's certainly. Uh, novel idea well it's novel and it's not novel we went with what worked we know blockchains work and uh so we put a blockchain in our blockchain there are all sorts of meme uh pics i'm sure uh we could uh dress up along with this so so that does bring us kind of to the next point which is that you guys have announced right that there's a metronome this token sale is coming up uh very soon um, can you give us an idea about the timeline on that? Yeah, it's currently uh, early March, and we set a specific date 10 days before the launch. We'll uh, publicly communicate the, uh, the date very specifically. Um, right now, we are uh, in the middle of uh, auditing. We have hired uh, not two, not, not three, but uh, heading towards four Ethereum smart contract auditors to uh, really beat this up. Uh, we uh, just open sourced it on uh, our uh, subsidiaries GitHub, and uh, we're uh, looking to have a public stress test on testnet before launch as well. We're building uh, some interesting wallet features to uh, go along with that and uh, to help with uh, the testing. So it's a one and done type of launch once it's uh, live. Uh, we have no ownership over it. We have no uh, ability to uh, turn it off or change it. And so it's something that you got to get right uh, the first time. And so uh, we, uh, we're only going to launch when we are happy that it is uh, secure for uh, consumer use and ready for the long term. So what I'm curious, though, is because March, beginning of March, you know, that's, that's almost now, right? We're almost there. I mean, actually, this, this podcast is, uh, you know, I don't exactly know which day it's coming out, but, you know, it will be right then. So one thing that I, I found a little bit difficult is, you know, reading through your the materials you guys have on the website is that it goes into very little technical detail. So, for example, if we talk about this, it, the different chains being, you know, kind of verifying each other, how those tokens are moved, like all of that stuff, is there's, there's not much information, especially since... The, the idea is the system kind of, you know, runs itself once with the launch, right? But you guys aren't basically, it's not just you have an idea and you're going to work on this for two years and, and then it's kind of ready in there, right? So will you publish more information on this before? Yeah, the cross-chain spec is a separate document and uh, that's about to be launched in uh, probably seven days, I think. Um, we're uh, polishing that. Every single dang document has to go through legal wrangling uh, as well as engineer review, which is very annoying, but uh, sort of the times that we live in. Uh, and so uh, we're going to be publishing that. We're going to be publishing a uh, sort of a how to buy uh, type document that uh, describes the descending price auctions in more detail, provides some uh, trading strategies like limit orders, dollar cost averaging. Um, that sort of thing, because it's a new auction format. Uh, there's no, no pre-sale, much to, to Wales' dismay. I get uh, like two or three emails a day of, how do I get in the pre-sale? I want in the pre-sale. And uh, 
you know, we, uh, we have to say, uh, go the, you know, sorry, go the public sale. Um, so that, that's sort of that format, uh, that we're, uh, looking for, uh, those two documents are, uh, going to be, uh, coming out in the next few days. We're also open sourcing all of the porcelain that we've built so far. Uh, that's, uh, the SDKs, the wallets, the, uh, the world's first, as far as we're aware, uh, ERC 20 mining pool. Uh, we're going to be uh, operating that as well. So uh, all of that is uh, getting opened uh, prior to launch. Cool. Well, uh, Jeff, thanks so much for coming on. And uh, I certainly look forward to, to that information and, and learning a bit more about how exactly uh, Metronome is, is going to achieve those things, because it certainly would be an interesting thing if you can create one of the uh, a token of, that's kind of not dependent on any of the chains it lives on. Uh, so that's a very interesting direction. So yeah, thanks so much. It was a pleasure having you on. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. And of course, thanks for listener for once again, tuning in. So we are going to have in the, in the links, uh, to the episode, of course, uh, you know, links to metronome website, the onus manual, which is a little bit like a white paper and some other documents that they have published. Also, there has been actually some source code, I think, of the smart contracts published. Uh, so, you know, we link to that. So if, if people want to dive into that, they can do so as well. And, uh, and yeah, so thanks so much for joining us. So you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, SoundCloud, your favorite podcast app, or you can watch videos on youtube.com slash episode of Bitcoin. And yeah, so if you want to support the show, you can also leave us an iTunes review. And otherwise, thanks so much. And we look forward to seeing you again next week.